Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, we have the pleasure of watching Jim Fergus, Ferguson tell us about the Canadian Black Dose. And the weekly tip, well, we're going to have some wet fly feathers, and uh, we're going to lead into something that's going to happen next week. But for, but for right now, I'm Al Beattie from Boise, Idaho. My wife is not with me. She's uh, partying in Arkansas at the Salbug Roundup. So... I'll ha you'll have to put up with me tonight, but luckily we've got someone like Ferguson to help us out, so that'll be good. In tonight's presentation by Buzz Busick Memorial Award recipient, Jim Ferguson, he will demonstrate how to apply the wishbone DeFeo preparation of hackle to wing salmon and steelhead flies. It's this method explored by Paul Jorgensen, Jorgensen to develop what he called a stack wing style as a replacement for several hard to find or protected feather materials. Rest assured, Ferguson's many years of experience at the Vice will make this presentation one to remember. Jim, it's all yours, go for it. Okay, well, welcome to everybody and thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, as mentioned, it's this book by Poole Jorgensen that uh, I was reading uh, some time ago, but there's a particular fly in here it's called the Canadian black dose. And when some of the exotic materials for salmon fly tying started to get uh, hard to come by, people were looking around for substitutions or replacements. He's got, uh, it's on page 97, he's got the uh, whole feather wing version. And then he's got the Canadian mixed wing version. And then he's got the uh, Canadian black dose stack wing method. And what he did was he found a way to mess around with uh, some of the feathers. And what he did, let's see if I can go to share screen here. So I just basically read through this bottom section here, but this is the fly. And a uh, couple things that are different from normal. Canadian, or excuse me, normal Atlantic salmon patterns. The way that he puts the throat on is different, and the way that he works with this wing is different. This is the schlappen feather from which I took the throat. This is what's called the wishbone preparation. So you just strip off some stuff and leave the stem, and then you cut it so that you have this wishbone shape segment. And whether or not it's wispy like the one on the left or whether it's fairly tight with, you know, or just in between with webby, it's good to have it, some web on it. Now you do the same thing for the stacked wing. Here are some wishbone from the three different colors. There's kind of a, a yellow, orange, a red, and a blue. And then you stack them on top of each other. Then the fun is you take this stack that you have and you take a toothbrush and you run it through there and you end up with this stuff here. And you, what you've basically done is you've unzippered all the fibers and so they're all kind of mixed together and they will sort of uh, reattach to each other. And that becomes your wing segment that you put on top of that black underwing. But you have to do it in a certain way. And so that's what I was going to try to demonstrate to you on this. The fun thing is, is that every time you tie one of these, they look different. That was one attempt. There's another one. What you'll also find out is each side may be different looking. Notice how the wood duck is not present so much on that side as it is on this side. And sometimes some of the feathers will become out more dominant than others. But in the water, that's what's really nice is when you put these characters in the water, they just look iridescent, the color, different colors play in there and the light in the movement will, will, will do quite a bit of uh, kind of a dance for you. I'm going to use a closed loop and a sailor hook Usually you have a black hook and anytime you use black thread and if you go over it with a lighter colored silk, 
quite often when the fly gets wet, it loses some of its luster. So quite often what you will find is that Atlantic salmon fly tires will use a white thread or they will use a, um, I guess it's called marigold. It's, 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 uh, it's almost a light cream or fine yellow color, real light. And where you start your thread will also depend on a couple of things. If you know you're going to have a material in the body, such as either a silver tinsel body or a body made from uh, uh, floss, you want a real smooth underbody. So you don't want any bumps. In that case, and especially with a loop up here, you would start up here at the front, close it back and do all those wraps clear to the back. And every once in a while you would spin it to get rid of any of the tightening up and cording that occurs. Now, if you were, if you knew that you were going to use a body that was going to be covered up with dubbing and stuff, you wouldn't have to start up there at the front. You could start somewhere in the middle. Now, the order of tying is, you know, mount the hook and you get the thread on. And then uh, with this particular pattern, you've got a few choices that you can make. So I always kind of go with the tip as being that little piece of silver tinsel that's usually used at the rear. And the tag is the floss that goes abutted up against it. And then you have the tail on top of that. And then sometimes you'd have a butt which would cover up a lot of things. So what I usually do is I take this thread down to about right in front of the point of the hook. And then I will take the fine silver, oval silver, and there's a way to prepare the silver to kind of minimize bumps and stuff. With something this small, it doesn't really make that much difference. But if you take and remove the outer coating, you will reveal the inner core of the tinsel, especially oval tinsel or sometimes I'll mount it towards the rear. And I like to do mine on the back side, almost, you know, somewhere around five o'clock, I guess. And then I will take it back using flat wraps and you kind of plan it so that up here you've you've got the core and you catch that metal right at where you want the uh, tinsel is going to end or start there and when you come forward and you'll bind that down and you take it back until you're about halfway between the point of the barb and the point of the hook. Maybe one or two turns there and then bring this forward. Get it out of the way. And then what I do is I wrap this. The first turn goes on the bare metal. And it's either three or four side by side turns, come back, tie it off on the bottom. 
three turns should hold most of your materials. Now what you want to double check is to make sure that those are nice and tight up against each other. Okay, when I tie tinsel, oval tinsels off, rather than just going in and cutting and leaving a bump, I'll come hold your, you got to make sure that you hold your thread. All right, I'm going to do is cut that a little bit and then I'll peel off that coating of silver. And then I'll tie this down Now I'll leave that tag there. I'll probably end up cutting it shorter. You know, be a dub body. I don't mind if there's a cut that and then there's a bump. But if I know that I'm going to have a silk body, I want that body, underbody to be as smooth as possible. So you don't want to cut anything that's going to leave a bump. But the next step is to take some silk. And what you will find is silk likes to stick to it. Basically, you used to be able to get these real easy because they were liners for, for gloves, for ski gloves. But silk does not stick to silk. And so whenever you're handling silk, it's good if, if you were Dave McNeese, you'd simply put it in your mouth and lick it and it would all stick not come apart or anything. Okay, now to tie this in, I'm going to come in underneath like this, up and over and around towards the bottom there. And again, I'm going to leave a tag there. I'm going to make one, two, three turns. And now I stroke this it pulls so that all those fibers are together. I go around, when I come up, I'll take this and then I'll bring this finger up. See, you, you see how that widens out right there? What I'll do is, is come in here and I'll put my thumb underneath there and it shortens up that, oops, that width. If you pull from way up high, the threads come down and spread out. If you pull from real short, they don't get a chance to separate like that. Now, ideally, you would go down edge to edge. But up against the tip and then come back with a very slight overlap. What that does is the overlap creates a very slight taper. Now, if you're really finicky at this point, you would take a, uh, this is a piece of ivory and you would burnish this to smooth it out. You know, and then you can, you can buy and get agate, pieces of agate too that work. Now, just to speed things up, I'm not going to put a tail on this. Uh, that one has a tail. This one does not. Now, when it comes to putting on the, uh, the rib, again, I've got some oval tinsel. Pull it off so that you, re re you reveal that core. And then you want to position it again, a little on the back side. And you want to position it so that you're going to, the thread, you may come back with the thread you want to catch just right there, right where the metal starts. So sometimes I'll go forward a little bit 
go around. And the reason I'm doing it on the back side is I know when I pull that down to make that first wrap that it's going to slide down underneath. And if I put it on the very bottom, then when I pull on it to make that first wrap of tinsel, it tends to slide up and come, looks like it's coming out the side rather than the bottom. I'm just gonna bind this down a little bit because this is a return loop and there's a little bit of a space right there where the return loop is not quite as, as uh, tapered as some of the other hooks. You can see where there's a drop off right there. What I like to do is to sometimes pull all this stuff over there and fill in that spot to make it a little bit smoother so that when it comes time to work with with the uh, the throat and stuff, I don't have that bump to to worry about. Since it's a Canadian dose, I'm going to use the Canadian stuff. What I'll do is I'll come up, I'll form a dubbing loop. Put that in there. Take the dubbing tool here, the cowbird tool and spin that. you should make a very thin body. Now there's also things having to do with weight and stuff like that of the material, but uh, I'm gonna have fun getting around that camera. And you don't wanna crowd the head too much or you really run into fun. And you don't want to do just that. <laughs> okay. Now, most steelhead and Atlantic salmon fly tires, they always figure you need to have five ribs. The idea is, uh, and, and nobody knows just why, but that's what they've come up with. But there is a nice re idea. If you take five wraps, the middle wrap should go right in the middle. And I can look at this body and here's the length and there's the middle. So my third wrap should come right up over there. So I'll go one, two, three, four, five. So it makes it easier for the tire to judge where those ribs should go. And again, some of the rules are they should, they should start at the bottom and they should tie off at the bottom. Only somebody who's kind of anal at evaluating flies worries about that. And again, what I do is I've got three wraps, hold, I, I hold on to this, and then I will take and strip off that outer coating. And then I will continue making one or two wraps. What happens is that I don't have a bump there caused by that heavy metal coating, a drop of that healthy hoof stuff, lacquer. 
or Salir. Okay, now comes the thing that you have to do, and that's work on the uh, wishbone thing for the throat. And here's that card that I have that that I had on that sharing picture thing. And so what I'm going to do is just take one of these. And all that is is black schlop, and it's just a big black feather with the length. And normally you would think that go, oh, all you got to do is tie this on like this and then pull on that and it would come down and make a very tight throat. Well, you can do that. Sometimes you end up tying down the stem. Now, well, not with this one, but with if your hook is longer or your hackles are shorter. Poole's way of putting a throat on like with this is he would come in here like this. And I did kind of a soft wrap. Now there's the throat. And then by pulling this, you can adjust the length. And usually he would have a length. He, he suggests a length goes back to about half the body. Most steel headers like to have the, the tips almost touch there at the at the hook point, but it's just short of the hook point. Jim, I've always called that incorrectly. DFO style hackling. I guess it's DeFeo. Yeah, DeFeo. Is, is that okay? He he was very he was an artist, and he liked to make uh, oh. A lot of st his steelhead patterns involved uh, oh, low water flies, which had a much, you know, their everything was up forward of the hook point practically. But he would make a very tight throat by doing it using that method. And so that was called the DeFeo uh, style and making that wishbone. And I'm not sure who. It looks like a wishbone, and I'm not sure who Rich started calling it a wishbone. I don't know if Poole did it or somebody else. I imagine somebody else did it, because as we have learned, everything we think we've designed and come up with, somebody else did it 100 years ago. Now, what you want to check for is to make sure that there's enough throat and evenly distributed around on either side. But notice that the stem ends clear up here. So when I trim this off, I'm only, I don't have a stem to worry about. This helps in making smaller heads and space that's flat up here and on the bottom. Now, sometimes I've, I've taken something like, pretend these were longer. And sometimes what I've done is I've, I've come in and I've tied it in like that on the side, tied this one in on the side, and then I'll take a third one and go right in the middle and I will pull it so that you've basically got it covered up on the sides and heavy on the bottom. But that's, that's if you need a heavy throat. Okay, so now we got to start thinking about that wing. Nope, first let's do the underwing. Black fine hair. Now, some people call it Fitch, or you can do like this stuff, which is uh, black squirrel. And if you want this hair up in here, now you've got a place where you can get to it. You got the length that you need. Now this says sparse. When you're cutting hair, it's smart to use serrated scissors rather than 
non-serrated scissors. And I'll take a little comb and I'll get rid of what under fur is there. And then I'll stack it and then take out the hair. And now you got to decide whether you want a long, short, whatever. This is an underwing. So you really don't want it sticking out too far. And you would definitely wouldn't want it to go past the bend of the hook. And I have found that if I pinch this where I'm going to tie it in, and if I take my lacquer and pre-glue that spot, the glue gets in there between the fibers. And then I also usually put just a small drop It's a little big. Where I'm going to tie it in. So what I found is by pre-gluing and pre-cutting, and you can either cut it straight across or you can cut at a slight angle. Set it down where you're going to be tying it in. And then there's the, the underwing. Now it's a good idea since I wanna have a black head on this thing to switch. Usually I would have switched before I put that on, I would have switched to black thread um, right after that throat. And I'll put a little bit more glue on this thing. Here's a whole bunch of different feathers that have nice slop and that have nice long fibers. You know, you take take the, your, your brush and you simply go like that and it separates the, the fibers. So what I've got here is a set of all of those stacked together. Here's where all those, John was asking, well, how do you stack them? Okay, just lay them on top of each other. What you wanna do is make sure that your wing slips in choosing these things, that you get a centered feather so that this, side comes up here, the tip here, and here match. You don't want one with a long side here and a short side here. You want to get some matched sections. Because you can always then, whether or not they match up perfectly at the base, you don't worry about that. What you want to make sure is, is that they're equally distributed on either side of that center. At least it'd be very difficult to. So I've stacked those, stacked individual ones together, and then I've run the comb or the brush through them to get them brushed. And then I want to separate them like that. 
So you got your right and your left side. And then I've, I've taped these together simply so I could put them in that card to show you. But you can tape them to hold them together if you want. Or you just hold them like I've got them. And if I didn't have all this tape on here, you know, you could get them together and hold them so that you've got them like that. Okay, now roughly I want the end of the wing to go past the black wing. Pitch down so that they kind of go around the sides over the top of that under wing. Make two wraps. Now you can. You can continue working with this and if it's just want a small strip in there. Try to get on the same width. Then the last step, now you can get fancy if you want. You can get, uh, you, can, you, could, you could even add, instead of wood duck, you, I could have put in some jungle cock or I could have put a, if I had a tail on it, it would have a little bit, uh, you know, you could, you could even put a crest over the top of this if you wanted. Usually the top of most of your Atlantic salmon flies quite often have a bronze mallard roof, which can be imitated by, you know, taking a piece of turkey like that and if you had wishboned it enough and had a smaller enough section, you could have had it on as the last one on top and then it would have done that. Or you could even gone with some white tip turkey. However, that usually is done for an underwing rather than a top wing. And then glue it. And usually what I'll do is I'll turn it upside down to let it dry so that this stuff is so fluid. It'll, by turning it upside down, it flows in there and makes the head a little 
helps seal those fibers that are attached right in there a little bit better. So this is this is what that Canadian pattern dose pattern looks like that he came up with. And like I say, every time you do one, they look different. We're going to talk about some wet fly ideas. And um, in fact, it's a lead in to what the whole program will be next week. Um, but we'll just get over to the materials area. Two materials today. Gray thread, just because I happen to have that lay in there. And some grizzly hackle feathers, and that's it. I already got a hook over here. To, to finish the, the story, I went looking for customers in North Idaho rather than trying to service customers from afar. It's always easier to work. I always thought it was easier to work face to face with people. Well, I met, met some people in Spokane at a fly shop that I was visiting there. And it turned out that they were members of the Spokane Fly Fishers and asked me to come and do a couple classes for them. And there I met a, a guy by the name of John Newberry. And he told me about a fellow that it was long since passed, but it was an old time fly shop owner in Spokane by the name of Ed Wolf. And he told me about a fly called the Cheapy. You might be wondering what, I, what we're talking about. Well, I've just got the biggest feather I could find in, in the room. And we're gonna just get rid of some of these fibers here and tie it on at the front of the fly. This is so easy that any one of you watching tonight no matter how skilled you are or are not as a fly tire, you can probably tie this in about two minutes. All right, we'll just trim that off right there. And we're just gonna start wrapping, placing each turn behind the previous. And the cheapie, as I said, is going to be a lead in for what we're going to do. All right, we'll just go another turn or two. Looks like an American thin care to me. Oh, uh, pretty close uh, until we get through it. Well, the one where I asked uh, Clinton if uh, well, okay. I'm going to trim that off right there. Crab flat, crab flat. You notice that the um, the thread is hanging behind the hackle application. Well, it's time now to finish the fly. That's oh yeah see yeah that's one and you just and you just finished the cheapy. I'll put a whip finish on. Now let your imagination run wild. And what could we do with that? Hmm, wet fly. Hey, maybe there's some dry fly stuff in there. Maybe there's some crossover. What about streamers? Well, we're gonna find out about that next week. And there's your <laughs> tip for tonight.